in healthcare. Um, on the other hand, there was the MoMA exhibition, Design and Violence, that presented designs that were intended to harm, um, from the design of AK-47s to computer viruses. Um, at the VNA, we did an exhibition about um, design as a tool for activist social movements, um, and a book, Unpleasant Design, looked at um, the devices used to exclude people from public spaces, like um, the spikes put in doorways to stop homeless people from sleeping there. So design can save your life, it can kill you, it can empower, it empower you, and it can exclude you. Um, what I want to start off thinking about is that no design is neutral, and it's just as important to recognise that. There isn't political design and non-political design. Every act of design um, embodies social and economic values and priorities and systems. Um, but very often we get presented with design in terms of aesthetic innovations or the possibilities for it to sell um, products, rather than looking at the wider impacts that designed objects have on humans and the planet, which can also be deadly. So I want to kind of kick off our discussion in thinking about the positive potential of design to change our world with a question, do we need more a more critical and responsible culture um, of design, and how would we create that, and, and what would it look like? And I was wondering, Kat, if you would start off in that area. Okay, do we need a more critical and responsible culture, culture of design? I think, in many ways, um, if you look at what's going on in design schools, then we have a lot of that culture in terms of many ways people write about design. But I think it's more about the kind of broader understanding of what design is. Um, to, to ask those questions, that, that should it be responsible, is um, one of the things that needs to be addressed. So maybe a different kind of understanding of what design is. Um, and to understand... <laughs> Um, to understand that everything around us is designed in the way that you're saying and therefore the kind of decisions that we should be making about our kind of everyday material culture um, which means that actually those, those questions around do we need to be critical and responsible in design is actually about us and the kind of decisions that we make as consumers about, about design in a sense. Yeah, I think, I think it's, a, I think it's a, an ethical uh, question uh, which uh, relates to how we live what we are as people, as consumers or as, as actors, uh, rather than uh, necessarily a design question. I think the problem I have with the question is, the, you know, the obvious answer is what is responsibility and where do we place responsibility? Uh, I'm, I work in graphic design, I'm a graphic designer. Um, graphic design, I think, operates in a different way to other forms of design, to, so product design, for instance. So uh, graphic design is about uh, enacting change, getting people to respond to something to pick something up, to turn left, turn right, or to buy something. That's pretty much what we do is communication. And we're expecting some kind of uh, reaction from, from an audience. That's, in, that's a, a form of power. And, that's a form yeah. of, and there's, a, there's a political dimension to that, no matter how hard or soft that is. Yeah. Um, but so I think there is some responsibility. And there have been moves in the graphic design industry for as long as I can remember to, to set up a kind of professional code of conduct for designers. But then they've come up against the the designer, the industry designers who said, well, why do we need that? We just, just, we, we're a service industry, we, we put form to things that are to, for, for money. It's what we do, and we don't need that code of ethics. So it's, it's been a, a debate that I've known for, you know, for as long as I've been involved in the profession, yeah. I think. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, so I think that as we sort of move forward and progress um, in the, into the coming years, I think ethics is going to underpin pretty much everything that we, that, that we do. The, the problem that I can see it is that, that, that us, as that's designers, practitioners, and educators, we all have our own personal thresholds of, of where we stand on politics, on the environment, on you know financial issues, and so on and so forth. Um, can we, or should we, all correlate our, into one single sort of thought or, or, or ethical sort of stance? And, and I think it, it, it is a difficult thing. Um, but I think that if we, because I'm an illustrator, so I'm particularly interested in visual communication and, and looking at the ways in which, you know, Russell's a graphic designer. And, and, and 
because of my own discipline, I'm always aware of what is happening with the DNAD and, and, and the sort of awards that they present every year. And over the past two or three years, it's been noticeable how many um, of those yellow pencil awards have gone to ad agencies who are now tackling campaigns related to the environment and to a lot of other of those sort of social issues which a few years ago were just not considered at all. Um, and, and you could argue that if, if that's the way that we're going to go, for me, that's actually a, a, a very, very good thing. Um, it's funny because I've been in education for an awful long, long time and, and attitudes change over the years. I mean, they, they really, really do. Um, and you know, I've just been talking about the environment. Uh, back in the 1980s, when I was working as a, a freelance illustrator, um, in, a, in a commercial sense, I can remember being uh, offered this commission <coughs> by ICI Plant Protection. Right? Um, I'm going to tell this story, because although it is anecdotal, I think that it, it sort of underlines where we're sort of heading with this. Um, yeah, it was ICI plant protection, and even back in the 1980s, I was offered a fee which then was five-figure sum, right? Today, that would be considerably more, because it was advertising, and, and, and we're going back to the age of Thatcher, right? So that should give you some idea of, of where we're sort of coming from. The actual brief itself was that I had to, to design or come up with this horrible chimeric looking sort of insect or creepy crawl that were actually um, that all farmers um, crop growers would want to destroy it had to look really bad because the product itself um, was an insecticide that had been developed to kill everything and when I say everything I mean literally everything so if you can imagine those great big fields in North America and all over the world, you know, thousands and thousands of acres of crops sprayed with this stuff. Everything that was living, but not just the insects, but everything else, would have been totally destroyed, right? Apart from the plants themselves, so that the balance of nature would be destroyed. Now the question is, this is the ethical thing, did I accept that? Well, yes. I did. This is back in the 1980s. We didn't think about uh, the environment then. It wasn't something which was talked about much in the media or, or, or anything else. Or, I hate to say this, but what I saw was that paycheck from Ogilvy and Mather Advertising Agency. Yes? Three years ago, right, when I was teaching at Falmouth, we were talking about ethics and moral concerns. And I presented this question to the students. I, and I showed them the, the example of the piece of work that I did and all the rest of it. And, they, and I said to them, now, would you accept that piece of work today? Bearing in mind the amount of work, the amount of money that you're going to get, and just think to yourselves, you know, in two or three years' time when you graduate, you know, you may have a family, uh, you may have all sorts of commitments whereby you will need that sort of money to, you know, to, to supplement your income. Um, would you accept it on moral grounds? And the interesting thing is, 60% of those students said no, they wouldn't do it. Right? The other 40% were on, were so, sort of said yes, but they were unsure. And their argument was, well, if I don't do it, someone else will. Now, how would that be in five years' time if I asked that question? It's likely that every student would have said that they wouldn't do it. Um, I went on the internet recently to see if that product was still available. And actually, it is. And it still does the same sort of thing. Although, that illustration that I did doesn't exist anymore. <laughs> <laughs> and I spent all the money. <laughs> um, that reminds me of um, a big billboard that um, Jonathan Barnbrook did a few years ago, that 
the famous quote, um, designers stay away from corporations that want you to lie for them. Um, so if you do make that ethical choice to stay away from corporations, how do you survive as a, as a young designer now? Well, that's a good question, I think, isn't yeah. it? I mean, I think I mean, I've only been teaching for about 10 years, um, but there's certainly been um, that kind of political awakening that you're talking about. You can see it even with that kind of short time period. And so yeah. I'm, I don't have any lovely or interesting anecdotes. No one's ever offered me that much money <laughs> to any moral question. Um, but the question of students kind of feeling like it's an either or, that certainly was the case, I think, you know, a decade ago. But I think that, that there's a, maybe a hope, however naive or utopian that might be in the context of an art school, that it's not an either or, mm. that actually you can make a living um, and you can also have a successful career and it can also be yeah. kind of underpinned by kind of an ethical approach. But then I think that's, that also reflects a growing market for eco-friendly yeah, chemicals or whatever it might be, that there's a kind of social change that's, uh, that's looking at things like climate change and therefore there's more jobs that the students can graduate to do in those areas rather than the other. I've got a, sort of a similar story that kind of doesn't involve me directly. One of my ex-students, I, I hope they're not here, um, <laughs> uh, a few years ago I was doing a project, a master's project about lying um, and there might be some students here who were at college at the time that I'm going to get into hot water with. Um, and he did a whole series of exercises. He managed to hack an email account so that an email program, so you could send the emails from someone else's email account. Uh, and he distributed it, and people were sending emails to their boss from someone else at work that were very abusive. And then the other, the, the, the other member of staff at work was getting disciplined, and it was all causing all sorts of problems. And he's made his final project. He set up a design competition that he sent out to art colleges, design colleges around the UK, uh, to brand an oil company. Um, but the oil company, he knew, had been involved in a major e environmental disaster. And he set up this competition, and there was going to be a prize. And he got lots of entries for this competition. And tutors took the brief, sent it for their students, like a DNA debrief. And the students sent all these competition briefs in. And in response, he sent them a letter to the students saying, you really should check your sources because this is an environmentally uh, unfriendly company. Um, and basically you've been had. He, he received literally death threats. Um, I was, uh, I, I, we had letters to the college that they found out where he, where he was studying and I was threatened uh, as the head of course for allowing a student to do this. Uh, for, and, and it completely um, disturbed the, uh, the eco-balance of, uh, of the education system yeah. really. And, I, and I'm sure there might be students in this room who did that brief. There's, I've certainly met students, oh yeah, I did a brief about branding and all that. Yes, it was a lie. And uh, it was a student trying to make a point about this. It was a great project, but it didn't have caused yeah. some problems. Yeah. Um, ethically, it's probably, probably completely unethical. Uh, and probably if it was going to go now through a university ethics committee, they'd say, you can't do that. You can't go lying to people and fabricating competitions and cheating students. But I just thought I'd give it as an example as a kind of mm -hmm. tag on for yeah. Yeah. a way of waking people up. A way of waking people up. Yeah, that was his agenda, really. It was, it was, it was interesting in line, but it was also he had he kind of tied it then down to a, a kind of debate about ethical principles. We talked a lot about things like the first, thing, first, first things first manifesto, mm -hmm. first things first 2000. Yeah. Do people know that? This, this kind of um, a manifesto for designers to, to work for the common good rather than work for horrible people. Uh, and it's kind of a difficult one to judge where you sit on that. Yeah, and also sort of where you draw your ethical boundaries, because a lot of companies are picking up on knowing that consumers have a higher ethical awareness, mm. but they're still doing that from a kind of a greenwashing, greenwashing point yeah. of view. And I think I was, I've been fascinated to watch, you know, in recent years, the, what's happened with the sponsorship of Tate um, mm -hmm. and, and BP, and they you know, kind of really committed to really liberate Tate, and they actually got, you know, raised enough public awareness that they dropped that sponsor, and also revealed that they didn't actually get very much from them <laughs> from, yes. that sort of, from that partnership. Um, so that, and I think that was an interest, really interesting kind of two completely different approaches of branding sort of coming together. Um, but of course, the activists who worked with the red tape weren't being, weren't being paid for that. <laughs> but I think you'd have to think, you'd have to hope that just because it's a corporation doesn't mean that it also yeah. can't have an ethical position. Yeah. Yeah. So while it means yeah. that actually the criticality has to be around, yeah. does that corporation stand up to what it says its values are? Mm. But I think there's no 
we don't really have much hope if we want to have a more kind of, you know, not be so damaging on the environment if we haven't got these big engines that can kind of actually effectively do that. And you can see that um, in terms of, we talk about the DNAD, but yeah. certainly the design museum, like designs of the year, they've changed quite a lot, I think, in terms of what kinds of, um, so every year the design museum runs a design of the year competition, and it's just, um, it's just about to open next month, they've announced the, the shortlist. And last year, the winner was IKEA, which had designed this flat pack shelter for refugees, which was a really interesting thing. You think, goodness, IKEA is responsible on the one hand for so much kind of destruction in terms of, you know, um, uh, in terms of kind of in engendering consumerism, but on the other hand, it's also got this kind of ethical approach. And this year, similarly, in terms of the shortlist, there's lots of um, lots of projects that are much more kind of politically activist with a big P or just, mm. you know, um, kind of smaller. Like is there a danger that, that it's the next step on from greenwashing, though, that that becomes a kind of consumer whitewashing? That, so that, you know, that you yeah. get this greater, that a company like IKEA can be say, oh, well, making shelters for refugees, we know that's kind of popular, and people <laughs> like that, and so they're going to buy more IKEA goods because they think we're a sympathetic company that does good things. Yeah. Um, and I'm... I'm slightly concerned about that, but there's, obviously there's a growing market and that's where designers can work, but yeah. I'm a little cynical about that. Yeah. As it's, it's how much you know, the designer is becomes the author or just a service provider, where do you draw that, yeah. that line of your, yeah, your control over the content? I think the other, there was another issue here, just moving on slightly, um, keeping with, with so the, the ethical concerns that we're talking about. Um, and the thing is that sort of we operate in, in, a, in a global society, really, particularly with, in relation to the media, the communications, and, and so on. And the thresholds and tolerance levels vary, you know, I'm talking ethically, vary, <coughs> vary from country to country, even here in Western Europe. Um, and and I, I do believe that, because uh, I keep saying, I would say to students, and I, I would say this to any, any practitioner, really, you can't acquiesce to the status quo. You have to be a, a, a provocateur. <coughs> you, you have to challenge and, and move forward. And the problem that I can see that we've got, particularly in this country, is that there are certain barriers put up. Dare I say the Advertising Standards Authority? Because I, I, I think... I think that they themselves, whilst well-meaning, um, I think that they are preventing a lot of stuff which could come out in a meaningful sort of way and really, and really get people to, to take on board some really contentious stuff for the betterment. And, and, I, and I'm going to, again, I'm going to mention a, a, a campaign which I saw recently. And the client, it was Amnesty, and I think we will all agree they do a fantastic job. Um, but this was Amnesty France, not Amnesty UK. And, and what it was, it was, a, it was a massive poster campaign. And it was highlighting the plight of young children who were forced into being soldiers in war-torn uh, third world countries. And what they had was this image and I had to look twice at it, um, you know, and I thought, my God, um, it, because it, because it was actually quite uh, it, it was quite a disconcerting thing. What they what they come up with, and this would not be allowed in this country, but it was just over the channel. Was a was a picture of a makeshift gallows somewhere in some desert sort of uh, country, and there were two or three young children swinging from these ropes hanging from the, from the gallows um, and, and with, with nooses like, like, like swings. And next to them were the lifeless corpses of, the, of, of victims of, of the particular uh, oppression. And, and pretty explicit it was too. I'm not going to go into graphic detail, but I think you can imagine what it sort of looked like. And I think the strap line said something about like 300,000 children just really want to play rather than uh, be soldiers. I mean, that, it, I can't remember the exact 
strap line, but it was a lot. It was along that, 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 that those those sorts of lines. So I think that if we if we really are serious about being provocateurs and all the rest of it, we we have to start to look at breaking down some of these barriers and not to worry too much about how much people are going to balk at these things. These are, these are serious issues, and and if you're going to if people have, if we want them to take note of these contentious arguments, you're going to have to 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 shoot them in the arm a little bit. Well, you know, I'm, I'm really serious about that. It might also be about where you expect the kind of critique or design activism to come from. Yeah. Because I think one of the 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 most powerful um, uh, examples of that that I've seen in recent years, in, ter in terms of our relationship with technology, for example, hasn't come out of the design industry, but it's been on television. So things yeah. like Charlie Brooker with the Black Mirror series that yeah. each um, it was a kind of yeah. design fiction exercise, like each yeah. episode would have a very unsettlingly similar environment and then with these technologies that are possible. Um, and that was some of the best, that's what a lot of designers have been, you know, talking about since the kind of 90s onwards, like using design as this kind of fictional tool. And in terms of reaching a big audience to talk about that, and, and one that people talked about, you know, at water coolers or their equivalent, yeah. I thought it was very effective in that kind yeah. of way. That tangible way that um, sort of fiction and design can into, into a future situation. Yeah. Consider it. Yeah, and make you think about your presence around yeah. it, I think. Um, going back to kind of graphics in public space, I wanted to think a little bit about um, the graphics for politics in Britain um, right right now, and um, <laughs> thinking glaringly of the big red Brexit bus that promised 350 million to the NHS. Um, which perhaps was was a brilliantly successful design. It definitely lodged itself in, in the public conversation very um, evocatively. Um, but you know, thinking back to um, the election in 1979 when Saatchi and Saatchi did a post of the Conservative Party, <coughs> Labour still isn't working with a big doll key. It was the first time um, an advertising agency was brought in to, to sell a political party in that country. And are we are our political graphics feeding into that impoverishment of our political conversation? I'd say absolutely. I think, I think that the, the, the Labour isn't working was in an incredibly successful campaign and three words and it does, it does the business and it, can, it carries a long way and people remember it. Um, and I think we've reached sort of a post-Twitter, post-social media set of catchphrases now where there's, a, to my mind, a playground squabble. Uh, over, over certain catchphrases, whatever that might be, fuck Trump or you know, sort of love, love overcomes or whatever those banners are, um, that don't actually mean anything, and we we lost any kind of nuance or any uh, political debate or critique uh, within that. So it's just become a, a bunch of sloganeers who are chucking bricks at each other, and I, I worry about that because I feel that I sit somewhere in the middle on that. I feel that I, yeah, with with teaching, I want students to be able to think critically, not just to adopt a slogan that doesn't really mean very much, whether that's the, the red bus or in opposition to the red bus, whether that's that bus is a, oh, I agree with that, or whether that bus is a lie. And I'm kind of, I will sit on the fence on that one, because I think, I mean, I voted Brexit for various reasons, but, um, and that, you know, causes a storm at work, but, uh, but because I was on the side of Dennis Skinner and uh, Tony Benn and a whole bunch of other people, so yeah, I wasn't on the side of, Michael Gove or someone else, but I think those things are much more nuanced and there's a lot more, there's a much bigger debate to be yeah. had mm -hmm. rather than, oh, that's black and white. Yeah, yeah. We, we believe in this, we don't believe in that. So are there ways that um, design and graphic design or communication more generally can create that more complex debate and get, get people talking from, from different sides? I'd like to see more questions in design rather than answers, actually, in terms of making people think about these complexities. I, I, I have to say, I think there is a distinct difference here between um, commissioning, or however you want to call it, uh, visual imagery, whether it's illustration or graphics, a distinct difference between propaganda, um, which is persuasive, and editorial commentary. The two are very, very different. And I think we're, we're talking sort of about persuasive stuff here. I mean, this is where we're sort of coming from about uh, the bus and the, the laborers and working people. Oh, just as a little aside there, an irony uh, with that poster, um, 
About three years after that, when Margaret Thatcher and the Conservatives had won that general election, um, and they claimed that Labour wasn't working and had a whole line of people so-called unemployed, right? Well, unemployment was much, much greater in the early 80s than what it was at the yeah. tail end of the 70s when that poster was put about. Well, that was just, a, that's just me remembering something. Um, but no, what, what, I, what I was getting back to was the fact that I, I think that where where critical debate can actually happen is, is where illustrators become, or visual communicators, become journalists. And, and that, that's, that's quite an important thing to say, because what you're doing is, is you're using your craft to visualize things. Instead of using words, you're actually you're making, you're making statements and, and you're coming up with your own opinions about how things actually should be across the board. Uh, and, and you're not constrained by having to come up or work with some sort of advertising campaign or some propagandist thing. The only, the only constraint that you might have is that if you're employed by a newspaper or a, a magazine or a journal which has affiliation to a particular political party, then editorially you will have to draw that or, or toe that party line. That's the only thing. But at the end of the day, I think that you need, if we're going to talk about politics, it's more in that area where I think that the, uh, the opinions and the way in which we could, uh, you know, move with change could actually come. I think as well it's um, setting up situations where people can actually meet and talk. And it's, it's a small yes. scale, but there's a project which I really love um, called Company Drinks, which kind of go back to the working class history in the East End of going out in the summer and hot picking. And they're kind of, they're looking at that history, but also reinventing it. What does that mean now for the communities there? And what can, can you pick? And they, they make drinks from it. Um, but what they're very good at is kind of selecting venues and libraries and town halls to hold events where actually a diverse audience comes and then kind of setting up a debate through this act of of making something. So they did a series of drinks called Sour Brexit, um, and you decided how much sugar you put into your rhubarb <laughs> fizz, um, depending on your kind of political views, and then you tasted it. And while you were doing that, you were talking to people, and it wasn't necessarily the people that you kind of shared social media sort of um, oh. consensus with. Um, and I think you were, uh, you were talking as well, you told me about a project in, in Shoreditch that did a similar kind of um, market yeah, well, I haven't yeah. been to see it yet, but um, the Kingston School of Art students have um, uh, put on a, a kind of installation or a project that's um, at the Old Spitalfields Market that's called Manor Factory, it's an old word for factory, and they are going to be um, working with the local community to think about different kinds of products they sell and different kinds of forms of exchange. So that's could be that they sell or they make products that are using waste materials, um, but also um, working with um, a design agency called Templo, also thinking about even using the stalls of a market in a different kind of way, so the stalls could actually become temporary shelters, for example. And actually, Templo are quite an interesting example of this more kind of complex, um, this sort of storytelling language that you're talking about. Because I have to say, I, I sort of, I think actually those slogans they're so meaningless mm. that I think there will be a, sort of, almost there is a reaction I think against some of that in terms of new um, new forms of kind of political communication that's coming through. But they they did a project a couple of years ago with the UN, so not so a different kind of um, body, and it was called Stop Torture. And it was um, the founder of Templo is he's British and his parents were Sri Lankan, and he wanted to. Um, raise awareness about human rights violations in Sri Lanka. So they created a, a branding campaign. Um, so using the skills of branding and kind of as visual communicators, and the word stop would, was trilingual. So it, would, uh, it was kind of digital branding, so it would move in and out of saying stop in English, but also in Tamil um, and also in Sinhala, so in, the, in the, the two languages of Sri Lanka, but also um, in English. And actually it was picked up and it was um, used in in various kind of campaigning, and it actually um, they say it helped persuade a few UN countries to actually um, vote for a kind of independent inquiry into what's going on in Sri Lanka. So we can actually you know graphics can have 
um, the kind of power, you know, or it can use that power that it has already that you're talking about to make people change what they do, and using the kind of new, the kind of interesting, different visual language that the digital can provide. Yes. Question that I would, well, that I ask myself is, you know, because I have an interest in the sort of the history of illustration and and visual communication, and look at how powerful it's, it's been. Um, is it as powerful today as it used to be? You know, you can attribute, um, you know, some of so, you know visual imagery which was produced back in medieval times of so actually changing the world. You know, some of you will probably know about this, but I have to reiterate it to make my point. I mean, when Gutenberg invented. Uh, printing with movable type. It actually corresponded with the Protestant Reformation. And of course, at that time, hardly anybody in Europe could read, but they could certainly understand um, woodcut illustrations. And these things, because of the printing process, millions and millions of, of, of pamphlets were produced uh, supporting this Protestant Reformation, and it spread like wildfire throughout the whole of Europe. So you could argue that the discipline of illustration actually brought that about. I mean, and other there are other his, uh, you know historical examples like the English Civil War. If it hadn't been for print for the um, for, for the invention of printing and 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 for the fact that a lot of what were then I suppose you could call um, cartoonists of the day. Um, actually sway the majority of people in this country to come out on the side of Cromwell. So if it hadn't been for illustration, it, we may have had a totally different result at the end of the Civil War. So, I mean, there are just two, two sort of examples of, of where we're going. And I'm just thinking, well, is anything particularly mind-blowing happening today? Um, I'm not really too sure. I mean, <coughs> we've had... You know, you just look at things recently, and I have to say this, and I'm unashamedly going to bring it up, Charlie Hebdo, okay? I have to do it. Um, and, you know, yes, I mean, I know full, full well, I've seen those magazines, and, and I can understand how a lot of people would, would, be, would be offended by it, and so on and, and so forth. Um, but, at the, but at the end of it, when I look at some of those things, they're not really doing anything to establish a broader mindset which is going to change anything. It's just a sort of a satirical sideswipe that a lot of people, in my opinion, are sort of some are offended by and some just sort of laugh at. And it's not it, what you know. We're talking about religion. It wasn't just Islam that was uh, that bore the brunt of it. I've seen some pretty blasphemous sort of stuff aimed at Christians and Hindus and all, all sorts of different religions. But it but for me it's not earth shattering particularly. Maybe this is maybe this is is just me. And I I I just worry a little bit that that there's not enough of this stuff coming out which is gonna be that is really going to um, you know evoke some sort of real real particular change. I mean that, that, I think you know. I think to a certain extent my issue to pick up on that, to follow on from that, is that I think it's the story of the interpretation of Charlie Hebdo and the, and the interpretation in the press, which by and large didn't reprint any of the cartoons that caused such offence, um, that people remember and people are aware of and people then campaign about and tweet about and get angry about, rather than the actual thing. Uh, and that's what I'm saying, I think there's a lack of subtlety, a lack of nuance, a lack of discourse. Uh, what I'd like students to learn, which is kind of what we're going back to the origins of higher education, what I'd like students to learn is criticality, mm. is being able to yeah. think critically and say, there's, uh, there's that great book about critical being, uh, where, where we, we have critical thinking, we take that into critical living, into critical being, that I am cynical about everything around me and every message that I receive, whether that be advertising, whether that be a newspaper, editorial, or whatever it might be, that I will question those things and try and find out as many facts as possible and find out for myself and offer an, an intelligent opinion yeah. about it. And that, to me, worries me that we get some of some 